I'm Trina Shoemaker, and I'm a recording engineer and a producer and a mixer. And my favorite project is the Andrew Duhon record. <laughs> because I'm in the middle of it right now. Welcome to the barn. Some of the other things that people would know, not necessarily me from, would be Sheryl Crow records, of course. So there's three Sheryl Crow records sandwiched in between her first and her last. And um, Queens of the Stone Age, rated R. A lot of people know about that. Emmy Lou Harris's Wrecking Ball. That's a great record. Victoria Williams. Um, a lot of New Orleans people know Grace and Caps. And, uh, well, here's an oddball thing. James Otto's song that is number one in, on the country charts right now, I Mixed. So, cool. A producer is the, the main person in the room from whom all of the activity generally gets cycled through, whether it's recording, the actual mic placement, or not having to worry about the mic placement and knowing it, um, the tone, or dialing it in yourself, or having someone else dial in the sounds for the record, sometimes arrangements of songs, song choices, tempos, keys, budget, administration of the budget, scheduling, the overall picture of the record, um, the big picture, knowing if you need something in the bridge to help the mix later, if you're the mixer or the person who will mix the record. And it doesn't mean you make these decisions, it just means that most of them will travel through you at some point or another and they kind of coalesce. Um, there has to be a focus in the room other than the art and the artist in order for the record to coalesce into a, into a machine or onto tape. So you are a kind of a collector of all the all the pieces of the record and, and kind of the you, you're the you're the general contractor on a building site, you know, so you're not doing the work, you're just making sure that it all goes right. I would like to think that no, I always just finds the find I always just find the universe that fits the artist, but because I'm a human being, therefore my universe is my only universe. So I guess I try to just take my universe and 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 alter it in whatever way is necessary so that the artist is part of it. But it, it still has to remain my universe because I, you know, because that's how I guess we perceive ourselves. I wouldn't know how to do it only their way because I only know my way. So, and I prefer to it, for it to be my way. <laughs> Not really. Absolutely. But you, the, you then would have to look at production on, 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 on the several different capacities that it can be seen in. Um, artist as creative producer of their own works, great. Artist as also creative producer of his or her work and administrator of the budget, um, maybe. Artist as creator and producer of the, of the work, administrator of the budget, setter of the schedule, collector of the union forms when applicable, um, and all those things. So again, production in the big picture has some very administrative roles, and an artist as producer would often have management that would then step in and take over those aspects of the production. Um, so, but yeah, artists are absolutely capable of producing themselves at all times, um, especially if they're shown how to navigate some of the, you know, slightly more technical aspects of recording, then with no problem can they produce and will they produce their own music. Um, a person like Neil Young, I, I only met him briefly one time and recorded him, but he struck me as artist, producer, engineer, mixer. I mean, he's done it all. He's worn all the hats. So in cases like that, absolutely, the titans can produce themselves. It, it wouldn't be a mistake. Um, it would just be that you got to make your first record, no matter what. You have to have your first baby if you're going to have children, no matter what. And you look back on that first event where something that didn't exist before is suddenly in the world, and you know you would do some things differently. You would be armed with the knowledge of, okay, I understand the process, um, even the subtleties of the process or the real obvious aspects of the process. Um, so they don't make mistakes, they just, they can't know. And so they have to navigate that, that first date 
as best they can. Um, because artists that are making their 15th or 16th record are more likely to make massive mistakes because they're quite sure that they know what's going on and that makes it easier to be wrong. If you just plain don't know, hell, anything can happen then. There isn't one. I like to get everything as much done live as possible because then that's a lot less for me to do later. And it feels good. And then, But it depends on the kind of record you're making. You might be re making a record that is loop-oriented, sample-oriented, pop-oriented in that way. And there's no such thing as the live tracking date. It's here's all the programming, here's the vocals, let's add some live, live drums later. So it, um, it just depends on the song. But the kind of music that I like to listen to would almost always originate with a live session and most of it being kept. I just, you know, you don't know, you just, you hope. You think that one sounded good to me, that's the take and you hope that later on it still sounds good to you, and usually it does. I mean, again, you, once you do this just a few times, you get a real sense of what felt good and what didn't. Did it feel good or did it not? You know, is it working as a song? Does it sound like a record in the control room even though it's just the basic tracks, you know? So if you sit back and go, man, this sounds good. It does, it, it sounds good, unless you're, you know, a functional moron in the studio, and then in that case, you should just not be in there. But I make mistakes, you know, I think that something's a take and four days later I don't like it anymore. I'm in that situation right now and I'm about to put new drums on a track because I'm not happy with it and I can't put my finger on it except that it doesn't make me happy every time I open it. And that's, you know, not a good sign for something that is supposed to go on a record because I'll skip it. You know, I don't want everybody skipping it. You're either out of money or you're out of time or it's done, you know. Mostly, you know the record's done when you're when you're either tired of it or you're, sca you're, you're finished because you're, you know, somebody's going on the road or um, there are people that keep reopening their records over the course of a year and then finally come out with the final version and half the time the one that was finished in a couple months was great and could have come out. Again, it depends on the bar that you're being asked to reach by yourself or by, by um, you know, public opinion. So you might think your record's done and then you find out from your label, your record's not done, and you're done with it, and that's not fun. So, mostly it's done when, um, when you meet the end of your schedule, all your mixes are finished, they've been tweaked, they're approved, record's mastered, everybody's satisfied, it's done. Well, that's, uh, you say obviously the vocal, you know, of course. I guess the bass, I don't know. Because when the bass is cool, you're cool. Um, not necessarily. Um, it has to be the vocal. I just like bass, so for me, you know, some of my favorite songs are because the bass line is so groovy. But that's not really answering your question. Th th there's no way to say that. That would be like saying, what's the most important part of the house, the roof or the foundation or the walls, or the, you know, toilet. You know, without any one of those factors, you're uncomfortable. So, yeah. A rather large degree of antisocial qualities, not sociopathic antisocial, just the ability to be by yourself for long stretches of time, to focus on something with something close to obsession without being an obsessive weirdo. Um, in my case, an enormous amount of uh, OCD, but not the kind that messes with the way people play, just the kind that, you know, organizes the tracks. <laughs> color codes and all that stuff. Um, you just ha you have to be musical. You have to be reasonably musical, dedicated. You have to dig it. You have to um, be a person who, when things seem like they're about to crash and burn, that you can either step in and point the whole session in a new direction, or it, it's kind of like being the mother of a three-year-old. Diversion tactics. Uh-oh, this has caused a meltdown. Hey, look at this. Look at what Elmo's doing now, and immediately switch everybody over to a new kind of uplifting, positive song that's going really well, and then come back to the problem. You know, diversion, good at diversions, diplomatic, um, you know, those things, yeah. Okay. I am a diplomat. <laughs> With the state of the music industry as it is now, and the kind of flood of home studios, the flood of of recording schools and, and people 
literally flooding the market. Um, was it worth it for me to spend 22 years becoming an engineer? Yes. If I had to start over again now with all that I know, um, I'd like to think that I would still do it, and I probably would have, um, but it was very fragile how it came to pass that I did this anyway. So um, I'd say with, for example, if I was young and had to pay for recording school, I wouldn't have been able to. And so that may have knocked me out of the running in the word go. I mean, I started as a maid. I didn't have to have any formal education whatsoever. Um, so there would have been factors that I may have tried and failed. Um, I, I probably would have tried. I can only imagine that me being born, you know, 18 years ago instead of 43 years ago, I still would have, you know, had a, made a go for it. Um, but it, regardless of the state of the industry and regardless of the, you know, amount of people that are now claim to or can in fact record music, um, it still really comes down to a basic individual's drive to succeed in a chosen field. That has never changed in human history. If you decide I am going to be an engineer or I am going to be a producer, I am going to be a foren forensic anthropologist and you're the type of person that tends to reach goals and sets goals that are reasonable to reach, um, you would succeed just as, easy, just as easy in today's market as you would have yeah, you know, 20 years ago when it wasn't such a open field. If anything, there's more opportunity because there's more of it. I mean, there was a time when record making was, you know, almost like NASA science. I mean, nobody could just kind of break in. So, um, yeah, it's hard to do, you know. Then and now, it, it remains difficult and fulfilling. Oh, it's, 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 it's entirely possible. Um, fate or luck or being in the right place at the right time has an enormous amount to do with whether or not you are going to get a break in the field of entertainment, whether it's in the movies or in music or in record making or anything, because those things seem to come together and, you know, yeah, had you been one day late, you wouldn't have gotten that job and then the domino effect of you going down that particular road wouldn't have occurred. Um, I was in a smaller market, but I was working at a studio owned by and, and run by a extremely uh, successful producer during the prime of his, of his success. And so he just happened to be in a smaller market, and I happened to one night, you know, drop off a tape there and uh, end up making cables for those guys. So. Yeah, it can happen in a small market. It just depends on, you have to find a way to or to be around a working engineer or a working producer that takes you on and takes you along for the ride. Um, again, that was true then and it remains true now. Uh, you know, a friend of mine was working with, and it's a second out in LA, was working with um, the people who were doing all the Gnarls Barkley stuff and Gnarls Barkley before crazy. Um, and Look what happened, you know? But they dug him. And when they went back to make their next record, they're like, Kenny, you're our guy, come on. So, you know, once again, a kid, he, was, he hadn't been doing it that long, happened to be on the session, that happened to create a record, that happened to sell millions. He happened to have endeared himself to that posse. And, you know, so it, it can absolutely happen. And again, it comes down to, were you sitting in that chair at that moment that something happened that you know, created a career for you. That is what happened to me in New Orleans. I, I got real lucky with a break, but I had the goods to do the work then that the break afforded me a, a, a possibility to do. I could have just as easily been fired after a week because I sucked, but luckily I didn't. And so the break came and I, you know, my guns were loaded and I was ready to rock and I did. Um, so luck, you know, you better be lucky and you better be prepared if you get lucky you'll be careful what you wish for. The, the crossover point for me from whether it was from assistant to engineer or engineer to producer oddly happened all in the same moment. Um, not uh, credited as such or paid as such but again I was working at Kingsway in New Orleans. Dan Lanois owned the place. 
Malcolm Byrne and Mark Howard, producers and engineers who obviously worked with Dan a lot and, and did their own projects, and I was just a kid. But if Malcolm hired me to be the assistant on a record, he was always playing. So I had to engineer. There was nobody else at, at the board. So then I'm engineering. Well, Malcolm's the engineer, but I'm actually engineering. And then they want to go out to dinner and they want me to cut the masters together. But nobody's told me what takes to use, so they're left me to choose the master pieces and, and cut it together. Therefore, I'm producing. Nobody's, and they didn't come back in. I mean, they just expected me creatively to handle it. Um, and I did. So at that point, again, I wasn't being called the producer, but I was acting out the role of producer. And by the time an artist actually came to me and said, look, will you produce a record with me? I had already done an enormous amount of what would be production, so I very confidently could say, yeah, hell yeah, because I know how to edit tape, I know how to determine a master for the most part, I know how to run a session, I know how to coach vocals, I know how to talk about arrangements, because I'd always been invited by um, Malcolm and Mark and Dan to be part of that. Um, they didn't draw a line. They drew a line, but it was a psychological line. It wasn't a... a um, a work enforced line. It was, you got an idea, you holler out. We want to hear it, we want to record it, we want to use it. Um, there, there were lines drawn. I'm not saying that I sat around and produced with Dan, but he allowed me to become a producer. And there was, so there was never any time when it's like, okay, your first production has arrived, what are you going to do? You know, there had been so many of them before that. Okay, ready? Well, here we have uh, SM7. It could be a 57. It happens to be an SM7. That's that guy. Um, and I don't care that it's an SM7 or it could be a 57, a Shure 57. Um, that would be fine with me. It's just that my husband took all the 57s, so therefore I'm using an SM7. But they, they uh, are the same. And then right next to it, make sure your caps are real close and even, right in front of the speaker, this is a ribbon mic. It is uh, modeled after a Royer 121 figure of eight ribbon mic. It's made by the Peluso microphone company. It's a very nice microphone and I'm using it um, as I would a Royer. And I stick them up there and make sure they're in phase at the board and off to the races. This is kind of dark, this is kind of bright and um, that's my technique and I really don't change it because I'm lazy and it works. Thank you. Oh, the phase. Well, you, they need to be in phase and it's real easy to know when they're not because you flip the phase button and they almost disappear. And then when you have the phase correct, they're fat and cool. And when they're not, they're out of phase. I don't know. You just have to flip the phase button and they'll, you'll figure that out. Um, but do flip the phase button because if they're out of phase, they'll sound bad. Um, and if they're in phase, they won't. And if you don't have the capsules close enough and on the same kind of line, you won't know if they're in phase or out. So when you flip that phase button, you should hear very, very clear, obvious dropout of the sound. It should be amazing how suddenly this big fat guitar sound goes to almost nothing. If that's not occurring when you fish, uh, flip the phase, you need to come out and move the capsules a little bit more until that does occur. And then you have reached maximum phase relationship. That's sweet. All right. All right. I'm going to act like a fun goof on that.